Welcome to Westfully AME Zion Church, where we are working the vineyard through faith, worship, witness, and service. Yes, we've had a new year come in, and, and even like last year, we're off to a rocky start so far with some of the events that are happening in our world. But I still pray and believe that God is going to move and deal with the circumstances of our world. God is going to do something to make things better. I believe that. And I pray that you will believe that as well, that God is going to move in all of his glory and all of his power and change and shape this world that we live in for a better world. Well, let's get into our text for today. It can be found in the book of James chapter four. That's the book of James chapter four. And we want to begin our reading in verse 11 and we'll finish in verse 17. And it reads, don't speak evil against each other, dear brothers and sisters. If you criticize and judge each other, then you are criticizing and judging God's law. But your job is to obey the law, not to judge whether it applies to you. God alone who gave the law is the judge. He alone has the power to save or to destroy. So what right do you have to judge your neighbor? Look here, you who say today or tomorrow, we are going to a certain town and will stay there a year. We will do business there and make a profit. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like a morning fog. It's here a little while, then it's gone. What you ought to say is, if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. Otherwise, you are boasting about your own pretentious plans and all such boasting is evil. Remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. Amen. I want to share today from the subject of something to think about, something to think about. And for a subtopic, God is in charge. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we come now into your presence and we ask God that you would continue to bless us, your people. We ask God that you would take this moment, bind our hearts together with you. Seal us, O oh God, as you already have in your power of your Holy Spirit. And I pray, God, that you would use this moment for understanding. I pray that you would use this moment, O oh God, to enlighten us. And I ask now, God, that you would overshadow me by your will and your glory. And I pray now, Father, that you would come in all of your power and open our ears and help us to listen. Open our eyes, for we want to see Jesus. Then open our hearts that we might receive him. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Blessed Holy Ghost. Amen. Something to think about. God is in charge. On Wednesday of last week, we have some people in our country who felt like they were frustrated and angry over the fact that they feel like they're losing control of their lives. And they feel like they're losing the ability to be able to control uh, the lives of others. And as a result, they began to lash out and show their frustration by trying to take over the house on Capitol Hill. Well, we should already know by now that that was not a God move. We should know by now that God was not in what was happening on Capitol Hill. But when we think about it, it's always an attempt for us as humanity to try to control our lives and sometimes to control the lives of others. See, man has always had this fascination with control and we attempt to control life on every level. Yes, we attempt to control life with each other by manipulation and deception. And not only that, we attempt to control life as we go out into the wild and we capture animals and we try to break their will and bring them under subjection to the human control. Yes, men and women try to control each other. And see, some people try to micromanage you to the point that they want to control what you say and, and what you do and how you act and how you don't act and even to the point of controlling what you think. But as I began to think about man's pursuit of control and power, I thought about how easily it is for us to allow others to control us. Some people have even found themselves desiring to be controlled by somebody else. Allowing others to control us often is because of a sign of insecurity in our lives or it's a sign of fear in our lives or possibly that we've suffered some type of psychological condition in our lives. Yes. And as I thought about these things and I began to think 
through the process of control and how we desire to control each other. And as I thought about it, I thought about how we fight as humans against God telling us what to do or God controlling our lives. And we fail to adhere to the word of God, which is what's supposed to be the governing force in our lives. But while we fight the word of God and while we fight God, we surrender so easily to human authority. We surrender so easily to the humanity in our world. Why is it that we fight God so, so much in our world, but yet we surrender to man so easily? See, God desires to lead us and to guide us by the power and the presence of his Holy Spirit. But he wants to do so out of love. But he wants us to follow him also out of love. God is not about trying to force us into subjection. He's not about trying to force us to follow him. He simply wants us to follow him because we desire to. It's because of love that he wants us to follow him. And it's out of love that he leads and he guides us by the power and the inspiration of his Holy Spirit. See, God's purpose and desire for us is to lead us and to guide us to the ultimate good for everyone. Not simply for a few people, but he desires for us to follow him and to follow his word so that the ultimate good might come about in the lives of all people, not just a few. However, man uses control and power for selfish and narcissistic reasons. Yet we surrender to the control and the power of man and fight God. Yes, but God is looking out for our best interest. He has our best interest in mind at all times. But yet we find ourselves in opposition to him most of the time in our lives. Why are we so fascinated with control? Is it possible that this fascination could be traced back to the Garden of Eden? Yes, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were told that they could be like God if they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Man's desire for control caused the fall of humanity. Yes, because of Adam and Eve's actions that day in the garden, it caused the fall of humanity because they desired to be like God. See how easily man was deceived and manipulated into giving control to Satan. And ever since we have been fighting God and we've been fighting the good and we've been fighting and surrendering to evil rather than surrendering to God. James is telling us in this fourth chapter of this book here that we are not in charge and that God is in charge. James is telling us that we are not in charge of ourselves and that we're not in charge of other people. It's time for humanity to wake up and to realize that we are not in charge. God is. One of the first things that I want us to see out of our text is this. We are not in charge of others. In verses 11 through 12, James warns us and he tells us that we need to think about how we speak to other people, or how we speak of other people. Are we talking about people uh, in a manner that is tearing them down? Or are we talking about them in a manner that lifts or builds them up? We shouldn't slander people or talk about them in a way that ruins or hurts their reputation. But we have to ask ourselves, are we talking about people behind their backs? Are we willing to say the same thing to them in their face that we're saying to somebody else? Do we have the right to overlook our own faults and failures to criticize someone else? These are things that we need to ask ourselves as we go through this fourth chapter here. And this is the things that we need to ask ourselves as we go through the rest of our lives, realizing that we're not in charge of other people. So how we speak about other people is a problem. If we're speaking ill of other people, if we're speaking falsely about other people, if we're speaking about people behind their backs, that's not what God has desired from us. That's not what God wants from us as believers. If we have something to say to somebody, we should be able to say it to their face. We should be able to say it in front of them and not behind their backs. But James tells us even in the text here, they says that even if it is true and even if this person is a sinful person or even if they are guilty of the sin that they have committed, it is still not a reason for us to criticize or judge that person. In fact, instead of criticizing and judging the person, we should be looking to help that person. We should be looking to lift that person up with our mouth instead of tearing them further down. James is trying to exhort us and encourage us to lift up our voice for good and not for evil. 
James wants us to know that in this practical book that he's written, that if we see somebody in a fault, if we experience a brother or sister in a fault, in a fallen state, then we're not supposed to run them down with our mouths. We're not supposed to talk behind their backs, but we're supposed to lift them up. But James warns us here not to talk ill or evil about our brothers or sisters, especially those who are in the body of Christ. But how easy is it to talk about somebody that's fallen into sin? How easy is it for us to gather a group of people and begin to talk about them? How easy is it for us to get on the telephone and talk about them? How easy is it for us to send a text message out to a group of people slandering or talking about somebody? We must be careful because if we do so, we are entering into sin ourselves. Instead of obeying the law of God, we find ourselves judging the law of God. That's what James tells us. He said, instead of you obeying the law and being obedient to the law, you find yourself being a judge of the law. You see, we don't hold the power or the position to be able to be judge of the law. We judge the law of God when we pick and choose which laws we're going to follow. We judge the law when we pick and choose which laws that we feel are important and which ones that we feel aren't important. Let me ask you. Which laws are important and which ones are not? Which laws are binding and which ones are not? Which laws deserve the most attention and which ones don't? Which laws should we keep and which ones can we break occasionally? If we choose to criticize and speak evil of other people, especially brothers or sisters in the faith, that we're parting from God's law and that we have taken authority over God and over his word. Yes, we have decided that we were judge and jury. We decided that we were in God's place and that we were going to execute judgment. We have to be careful and realize that we are not in that position and we can't hold that position. And we shouldn't pick and choose which parts of the law, which part of God's word that we're going to keep and which ones we are going to occasionally break. When we pick and choose, we set ourselves up as God. When we pick and choose, we're setting ourselves up as the law of God and over the law of God. Think about how we judge others. Judging others puts us in the place of God. But there is only one lawgiver, and it is not us. The one lawgiver is God himself. But we try to claim the rights and authority of God when we pick and choose what scriptures we're going to follow and which scriptures we're not going to follow. When we try to speak ill of someone and we judge people, we're picking and choosing which laws we're going to follow. We're trying to step into the role of God. But there again, there is only one lawgiver and it's not us. It's God Almighty. There is only one person who can who is able to save and to destroy. There is only one person who can judge and criticize whether or not a person is good or bad. There is only one person who can judge whether or not either a person is worthy of being saved or destroyed. And that person is God. We don't hold that right or that position to be able to execute judgment upon anyone. Only God is able to execute that type of judgment. When James says judgment in this text, he's talking about condemning. None of us are in the position or have the authority to condemn anyone. Only God has that Ability and only God has that authority and power. So what James is trying to get us to see in verses 11 through 12 is that we do not have control or charge over anyone. We don't take control or charge of anyone's life. Our lives are, are hard enough as it is. So why are we trying to take control and take charge of someone else's life? James warns us about the evil of speaking ill against our brothers and sisters especially those in the faith. He warns us to keep our mouths pure. He warns us to worry about the law of love. Yes, the, the royal law. That we love others as way we love ourselves. That we love our neighbors. If we would learn to love our neighbors, then it wouldn't be uh, the turmoil in the world that we have now. If we learn to love our neighbors, we wouldn't speak ill of people. If we would learn to love one another, and if we loved others the way that we love ourselves, a lot of the troubles in our world would disappear. But so many of us desire to sit on the throne. So many of us have surrendered to evil rather than surrendering to God and surrendering to good. 
And because of we surrendered to evil and now we sit on the throne of our lives trying to dictate what we do and what we don't do. We're trying to dictate not only our life, but we're trying to dictate the lives of others. Why? Because we feel like we should be in control. But let me help us out here. And I pray that we understand this, not only this today, but the rest of our lives. We are not in charge. We are not in charge of others. So let us be careful about trying to control somebody's life. Let us be careful about trying to run somebody's life down. Let us be careful about trying to judge other people when we cannot judge other people because we are to be judged ourselves. Yes, and I know some people say, well, the Bible says you can judge, but make sure your judgment is accurate. And also what he was trying to tell us in that text was that we're supposed to be helping a brother or sister overcome a fault. Too many times we are judging people just to tear them down even further. Too many times we're judging people and we're talking about people in order to build ourselves up in order to make them look bad. Let us really understand what James is telling us that we've got to get it right. We got to get it right with our mouths and we got to get it right with our attitudes. We can't judge anyone. There is only one lawgiver and only one judge. And that is God almighty. I only have two things I want to share with us today. And the second thing that I want to share out of our text is this. We are not in charge of ourselves. In verses 13 through 17, James is clear in his message to us. That we're not in charge of even our own lives. While in verses 11 through 12, he tries to help us to understand that we're not in charge of others. So we have to be careful about the actions that we undertake when it comes to dealing with other people. But he wants us to be also clear that we don't even control or not even in charge of our own lives. We have to, first of all, think about the plans that we make. James says, think about the plans that you make. We make plans, but do we make plans with God in mind? What James is telling us that we make plans and we often do it without God. We leave God out of the plans that we have. We leave God out of the planning process when we uh, don't include him or we don't ask him in prayer the direction that we should go in. The Bible is not telling us to go through life with with no plans and, and he's not telling us in the Bible to, to not have any plans for life. But what James is telling us is that when we make our plans that we should involve God in the planning process. That we should ask God, or we should consult God about the plans of our lives instead of just making plans and moving forward without even having a thought of God. Yes, sometimes we are considering ourselves to be self-sufficient. Self-sufficiency seems to be the driving force of many of our lives. Despite the warning of scripture, we set out to control our own lives. Yes, we believe that we are capable of handling our own life. We simply say, it's my life. I don't want God getting in the way. And we go on and we plan our lives. We decide what we're going to do. And we just go through life making all sorts of plans and deciding what we're going to do. But one of the things that James wants us to see also is this. We fail to see the uncertainties of our lives. Yes, he tells us that we make plans without God and that we go through the process of planning life and we leave God out of the whole process. But he also lets us know that we fail to see the uncertainty of life. He says we plan to go to a place and we go there, but we don't ask God. We don't make God a part of that plan of where we're going to go. We plan on how long we're going to be in that place, but we didn't ask God. We plan on what we're going to do while we're even there. But we didn't ask God. And yes, we even go so far as to planning how prosperous we're going to be while we're in that place. We should plan our things in our lives and we should plan our lives with pencil and not pen. Some of us may have planners and we go through the process of planning out our day or planning out our week or even maybe planning out our year. But how often are we consulting God in that planning process? Are we taking the time to put God in the forefront of our thinking? Are we allowing God to take the lead in our planning process? 
Or have we simply in an arrogant fashion decided that we're going to plan out our own lives and we're going to do what we desire to do instead of following what God wants us to do or allowing the spirit of God to lead us and to guide us in a direction that God wants us to go. Yes, we should plan our lives with pencil and not pen. Does God have the right to interrupt the planning of your schedule? Does he have the right to interrupt the planning of your life? Or is your life so set in stone, according to your understanding, that God doesn't have a choice? Yes, we can't plan our lives so to the point that we leave God out and that God doesn't have an uh, avenue to interrupt our lives. Yes, we should be willing to allow our lives to be interrupted by God because God knows best. God understands everything that we're dealing with. He understands everything that we're going through. But notice what James says. We'll say tomorrow. We'll say tomorrow. But how many of us knows what tomorrow is going to bring? None of us even knows what's going to happen on tomorrow. In verse 14, James says, who are you? You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. And in fact, your life is like a vapor, a puff of smoke, some mist. It's gone after a little while. The reason that we should include God in our plans is because he has knowledge of tomorrow. God knows tomorrow. He understands tomorrow because it's Bible tells us he knows the beginning from the end. He knows the end from the beginning. And because God has that knowledge, we should understand and know that he holds tomorrow in his hands. So why are we trying to figure out something when we don't even know what we're going to be in store for on tomorrow? Why shouldn't we include God in our plans? Because he knows what's happening on tomorrow. God knows what's going to happen five years from now. So why not include God in the planning of your life? Why not allow there to be space for God to be able to come in and change the plans that we make? Yes, we should include God in our plans. Think about it for a moment. Do you know if there'll be an accident on tomorrow? No, you don't. Will you have a broken relationship on tomorrow? You don't know. Will you get bad news or good news on tomorrow? You have no idea. Will you even be here tomorrow? None of these questions can be answered by us. There is only one person who can answer these questions, and that is God. God is the only one who can answer questions about tomorrow. We're in the dark when it comes to tomorrow. I don't have a clue what's going to happen tomorrow. And you don't have a clue as to what's going to happen tomorrow. But God does. So therefore, when we wake up in the morning and as we begin to plan our day, ask the Lord to give you guidance. Ask the Lord to come in. And yes, if he has to, to interrupt your plans for today. Don't set your schedule so hard in stone that God can't come in and interrupt your schedule. But leave room for God to come in and lead and guide you through your day. Leave room for God to come in and guide us through our year. Leave, leave room for God to come in and guide us through life, period. But think about the place that God has in your life. And most of the time we go on living life as if there is no God. And if we have to tell the truth about it, most of the time, even as Christians, we go on living life if, if there is no God. We go on living our life without considering God. See, man is dependent on God for life. Notice what James said. He said, if it is the Lord's will, we will live. Yes, James is trying to get us to understand that the very life that we're living is dependent upon God. So if we're going to live, we should say, if it's the Lord's will, we will be living on tomorrow. None of us even know if we're going to be living on tomorrow. We pray that we will. And I pray that we are living on tomorrow. But none of us can arrogantly say that I will be here tomorrow. We can only pray and hope that God will give us another day. And see, man is also dependent on God for life's actions. James says, if it is the Lord's will. We will do this or do that. Yes, life's actions are dependent upon God. We have to make sure that we understand that everything I do in life is dependent upon God. 
God is the source of my life. He is the one who makes it all possible. And if we are so arrogant that we feel like we can do it all without him, we are sadly mistaken. See, James wants us to understand that God must be acknowledged in all of our ways. James says God has to have a word in your life that God has to be acknowledged in our lives. And that's one of the reasons he said, if it is the Lord's will, we're acknowledging God when we say, if it is the Lord's will, if it's the Lord's will, I'll live on tomorrow. I'm acknowledging God. If it's the Lord's will, I'll do this or do that tomorrow. I'm acknowledging God in my life. But James further warns us about boasting and being arrogant. He said, how can we boast when our lives rest in the hands of God? How can we boast about anything when our lives rest in the hand of God? Paul said, if we boast about anything, let us boast about God. Let us boast about his saving glory and his saving grace. We can't even save ourselves. So how can we boast? But James also wants us to understand that he says, how can we boast if we know what to do and don't do it? My brothers and sisters, that's sinful. If we know what to do and we don't do it, that's sinful. But James says, how can we boast about anything if we're leaving God out? If God is not being a part of our life, we're simply being arrogant about our lives. We're showing a self-centered and a self-sufficient arrogancy when we're not allowing God to lead us and to guide us. And we're not thinking about God in the midst of our day-to-day -day action when we are choosing to lead and guide ourselves rather than to fall under the submission and the control and authority of God. We are allowing ourselves to be led astray because I guarantee you, none of us knows what happens on tomorrow and we can lead ourselves astray by trying to figure it out. We got to make sure that we understand that James wants us to see and know that we are not in charge. Yes, we are not in charge of other people and we're not in charge even of our own lives. So I pray that as we keep going on in life and as we keep living life, let us make sure that we're giving God a place in our lives. Make sure that we are allowing God to be able to intervene in our life and, and interrupt our schedules. Make sure that we are allowing God to come in and be able to have a place in our lives where he can show us a better way, where he can lead us in a different direction. Some of us have had moments in our lives where we were going in a course of life or a certain direction of life, but then God came and interrupted that course that we were on. And now that you look back, you realize that if God had not interrupted that course of action that you were on, life would not have been the same or life may not have been life for you at all. But I'm so grateful and I'm so thankful that God came one day. He interrupted the course of my life. Yes, I was on my way to a burning hell. I was living life under my own control. I was living life under my own circumstances, how I determined my circumstances were going to be. And I was simply making a mess of my life. But then God came and interrupted my schedule. And I had sense enough to allow him to interrupt my schedule. And he not only interrupted my schedule, he interrupted the course of my life. And because he interrupted the course of my life, he set me on a new course. And I'm so grateful and thankful that as he set me on this new course, I discovered a life that I would never have lived. I discovered a life that I would never have discovered. Had I kept doing life my own way. Yes, I was even talking about people. And yes, I was even running people down with my mouth, being arrogant and presumptuous. And yes, I was doing all of the things that this text said. But then I realized when God came in that I was not in charge. I was not in charge of others. And I was not in charge of even my own life. Because only God knew what was going to happen on tomorrow. So I'm grateful and I'm thankful for the interruption that God made in my life. I'm grateful and I'm thankful that God got my attention one day and he was able to show me a better way. So I pray at this moment, won't you give God the opportunity to interrupt your schedule? Won't you give him an opportunity to set your life on a new course? 
Why don't you accept your son, Jesus Christ? Today is a good day. Every day that you have breath in your body is an opportunity. If you have not accepted Christ to accept Christ. So pray this prayer with me. Father, it's in the name of Jesus that I come now. I pray God for your forgiveness. I pray God that you would forgive me of my sins. And then God, I pray that you would forgive me for trying to take control of my own life. And not only mine, God, but forgive me for the times that I've tried to control the lives of others. Forgive me, oh God, because I have sinned. And I ask now, Father, that you forgive me of my sins, that you would come in and save me. Come in and fill me, O oh God, with the power of your Holy Spirit. Fill me, Father, with your Holy Spirit's presence. Cleanse me, O oh God, and make me a new creature in Christ Jesus. Father, I accept your son, Jesus Christ, as Lord and Savior. And again, God, I say that I'm sorry for my sins. And I ask now that you would come in, save me and forgive me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, why don't you drop us a line at the email below and let us know that you've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And for those of us who are already in the body of Christ, I encourage us. Let us realize that we're not in charge. We're not in charge of others. We're not in charge of ourselves. So let us live like we're under the authority of God. Let us live like God is in charge because he is. So let us get off the throne and let God have his place. Until next time, God bless you.